A year before the harvest, the cotton has already been negotiated. Armand Desaisers has for a long time been working with Burkina Faso, today one of Africa's foremost producers of cotton. The harvest season is starting and the producers are bringing in the crop. We'll see it better at the factory. They'll clean off all these bits here. We'll see. <laughs> Armand de Césaire's business contact is Sofitex, a semi-public company that oversees and commercializes cotton production in the west of the country of 500,000 tons of cotton seed. Ah, oui. Armand de Césaire has already bought this ah, cotton yeah. a year before it's been harvested. He's not only bought it, but has already sold it to Asian spinners. I hope it'll be better than last year. Will the promised quality be delivered? It's the moment of truth. We come here to the sorting room to see Joël and we say, right, so what are we really getting here? We have to deliver to our clients and we have to know what we'll be giving them. And you have to match the specifications of what you're selling as closely as possible to what's being delivered. And you'd never be able to do that without the results you get from the sorting room. The moment the cotton is bailed up, the traders try to move the merchandise as fast as they can to respect their deadlines. It's all now a question of logistics, and everyone's in the same boat, be it Louis Dreyfus, Cargill, or Armand Azetzer. They all sit there in the same chair, opposite Paul Sourabier, who controls all shipments for Sofitex. He's the man you have to negotiate with. I can start loading, but I don't know when they'll be leaving. Can you get it off by train then? Yes, by train, no problem. I already started doing that last week. If all goes well, these balls of Burkina Faso cotton will in a few months be in the hands of the Asian spinners. From purchase of the product until delivery, the commodities traders need a lot of financing. That's where the banks come in. A bank really hates risk. A trader likes a bit of a risk, but it's something a banker just can't stand. So he lets the oil trader take the risk while the bank finances it in the background. Oil trading, for instance, has certain merits, uh, such as that you typically uh, transact large tickets, which makes it uh, operationally very efficient. If you look at uh, a crude oil trader, uh, uh, which, which executes transactions uh, with a typical tenor of 45 days, that means that they can turn around eight times uh, their credit line a year. Uh, so, so uh, and knowing that uh, crude oil cargo is something between 120 to 250 million dollar, you can imagine what what uh, amount of money is involved in that business. And no, I don't imagine. <laughs> you know. <laughs> but can you tell us? I mean, there are uh, in, in in the crude oil sector there are companies which which have turnovers between uh, 100 million upwards to to two three hundred million dollars. Uh, the very big Premium. ones. Billion dollars, yes. Well, I don't use a lot of bankers today. I use uh, trade finance funds because the banks have had uh, have been very erratic in their uh, relationships. When when it's sunny, they give an umbrella, and when it's raining, they take it away, and uh, they tend to do that um, all the time. 
that that means that uh, that you don't like risk. You are risk adverse, but banks too. Banks too, but sometimes, you know, back in the. In 2008 and 2009, their shares collapsed and they didn't have enough cash to, to provide uh, financing. And, and it was a drama, it was horrifying. We were wondering how the world is functioning, how the trade flows are being financed. The banks cut a lot of lines, took a lot of people. Did they cut for you? Uh, at the time, yes. Mm. yes. So yes. what happened? Uh, at the time, I had to liquidate my company, yes. Was it uh, a drama? <laughs> Worse than a drama, yes. Yes, it was my life, yes. Yeah. Traders who love their product and their job have also for a long time had the reputation of being speculators. The history of trading is also the history of speculating. As far back as 1909, in his film A Corner in Wheat, the American filmmaker D.W. Griffith tells of unscrupulous dealings of a speculator as he makes his fortune on the back of the suffering peasants. Speculating is part of the job. It's important for a trader, and in my case, the commodity I'm dealing in is rice, to be able to foresee the rise and fall in prices. So you have to take a position and buy what you know you can sell at a profit, or sell only when you're going to make a profit. And that means speculating. They call Anthony Ward chocolate finger. He's considered to be the world's greatest trader in cocoa. In 2010, he hit the headlines when he bought almost all the cocoa stocks on the Ivory Coast, the world's biggest exporter. Just weeks later, civil war broke out in Abidjan, and cocoa prices went through the roof. Anthony Ward had played a winning hand. The wheel turns, though, and in November 2013, he had to sell his business. It's perfectly obvious that for the dominant players on the market, there's always the temptation to hold back sales in the hope that the price will rise, to buy up as much as they can to force prices up and then sell at a big profit. That's what trading's all about. The big problem, though, is the lack of transparency. There may be a certain discretion about the business. Perhaps companies don't share information about their infrastructures, about how many silos or warehouses they've got. But there's no way there are any hidden stocks, any Alibaba's caves hidden away in deepest Amazonia. That just doesn't happen. But an unprecedented revolution is set to shake up the world of trade and opening the door to an entirely different kind of speculation. You have to go to Chicago to understand what's happened at the turn of the 21st century. Both traders and producers have always sought to keep one step ahead of price fluctuations. To manage the risk, they created the futures markets. The most famous of them is the Chicago Board of Trade, a legendary center of the agricultural commodities market. There are other traders working here known as paper traders, as opposed to traders on the physical market. Trez Knipper is a paper trader. I'm watching crude oil here. I've got a big position in crude. Um, I'm also watching other markets. Um, and then I'm on Twitter, and so I will monitor Twitter for me is a good source of news because people will talk about what's going on and it'll show up. So I'll kind of keep an eye on that and then I'll make comments. Uh, there's some people that are listening to my comments um, in the crude oil and I'll, I'll kind of tweet about it and say, I think this or I think that. You know, just if anything else, it's to watch and see what's going on. Step by 
at the Chicago Board of Trade, paper traders like Trez Knipper deal in futures. In financial speak, a future is a derivative product. For the traders, it's a form of insurance that covers them against price fluctuations. Actually, if the futures markets exist, it's because the insurance companies refuse to insure against price risk, and for one very simple technical reason. If you have a car, you can insure it against theft or against fire because you know how much it's worth. And the insurer, too, knows just how much a particular car is worth, so he'll insure it at a rate that he's able to estimate. He can fix the price and the amount. With raw materials, though, the margin for price rises or drops, especially rises, is infinite. So the risk isn't quantifiable. And it's because the insurance companies couldn't cover that risk that the futures markets were created. When you buy a large quantity of cotton at any given moment, you know you're going to resell it in a month or six months or in a year or two. Throughout the length of this contract, as long as you haven't sold it, you're at risk from the price. So there's a way of insuring this price risk, the financial market. So to cover himself against price fluctuations, Armand Ezezer is going to sell a future to Tres Knipa. I sold all the jeans at 120.80. In stock market language, it's known as a position. And when you're actually selling your physical product to the spinners, you buy that position back on the stock market, which sells it back to you. So, Trez Knipper is a speculator. By buying and selling futures, he hopes to make a profit while enabling the traders to cover themselves against varying prices. You good? All right. It's the time-honored custom for the producers and the buyers of agricultural products to cover themselves against evolving prices and against the unpredictable risk that entails. The speculation this involves is basically healthy and it encourages and facilitates fair exchange. But it's true that the arrival of big investment institutions, investment funds and investment banks, whose only motive in the way they approach the markets is a financial one, has twisted the rules of the game. In the year 2000, the internet bubble had burst and IT stocks had collapsed, and investors turned to the commodities market for new sources of profit. The big banks and the pension funds like CalPERS, which alone handles $280 billion, started mass buying futures. Commodities prices soared. These days, we just don't know what the big funds are up to. Why do they suddenly turn up on the market and invest billions in sugar, for example, or oil or soya? We can't know why they do it, because they have such wide portfolios that they have to invest a certain percentage in soya, a certain percentage in coffee or in sugar, in gold, in oil or in currencies. And with all the money they've got, well, it all comes in at once and the market just can't control it. They say to the manager of CalPERS, look mate, if you don't bring in a 12 or 14 percent return on investment, you're fired. And the CalPERS guy, he's going to raise the stakes. And of course, then the trader doesn't have a chance, because he's dealing in physical commodities, whereas the sheer volume of paper trading has become much more important. Traders who are employed by investors have a know-how that's very adaptable. They're just as good on the stock market as on the metal or oil markets. And if you take a trader who's working in wheat, for example, and you move him over into oil, he'll be fine. 
il va s'y retrouver. Because it's probably going to be the same tools he's using. And that's because he's not dealing with the fundamentals of the market. He's using mathematical tools. The latest development in this new virtual world of trading is the creation of computer bots programmed by algorithms and capable of taking both buying and selling positions at the least fluctuation of the market. You sometimes get what we call automatic orders as a result of this kind of trading that just turn up on the market out of the blue with buying or selling orders for thousands of shares. And that obviously immediately causes quite a lot of frankly ill-considered movement. We usually hear about it the next day, when the experts from the commission agencies inform us that automatic orders have come through from some computer. That's how we find out. But you know, once you've seen the shares, it's too late. It's a done deal. They've either been sold or bought, so most of the time there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to live with it. Irrational behavior is becoming a characteristic of the market. High-frequency bots work by the millisecond, and they can make colossal profits or, in the space of minutes, bring about huge crashes. <laughs> Financiers all claim they have nothing to do with steep price rises. According to them, speculation merely amplifies the high prices, which in fact will always remain fundamentally linked to supply and demand of the physical product. In 2008, though, the crisis that hit the cotton market proved this claim to be untrue. That year, the harvest was good and the prices increased only slightly. It was a windfall for the investment funds, who saw great potential profits in it. They bought up huge numbers of cotton contracts, and in the space of a few months, prices doubled. The reaction from traders was first of all one of panic. It was real panic, because it was just like a great big hole. We were heading into a black hole, and we didn't know what to do. We were scrabbling for money every day. We couldn't sell anything, and we didn't know how long it did go on. You were calling your banker every day, saying, I've got my futures position, my physical position, you have to cover me. So, how much was at stake? Well, for a company like ours, it was several hundred thousand dollars every morning. That's pretty much untenable. And so the banks were saying, look, we can't go with that. Liquidate your position. For any traders who found themselves having to liquidate that position, that meant a net loss. I think there was before 2008 and after 2008 for a company like ours, and also for others that were a lot bigger. It meant thinking again about investing in the futures market. And it also meant rethinking what period of time we could leave ourselves at risk from prices.